The Prime Minister calls it beyond frustrating. Michael Wood quits as a Cabinet Minister after more shareholdings that clash with his portfolios are revealed. Former police boss Mike Bush will take over Oranga Tamariki's youth facilities after two staff are accused of sexual misconduct. The frantic effort to find the Titan. Five men are stuck on a submersible with less than 30 hours worth of oxygen left. Tēnā koutou katoa, good evening. The Secondary School Teachers Union is calling off all strikes. That's effective immediately. The PPTA says there will be no further industrial action while it works through the arbitration process. It's the latest development in their ongoing battle for better pay and conditions. We're joined now by Perry Wilton. And Perry, what more can you tell us? Yeah, good evening, guys. The PPTA, or the Secondary School Teachers Union, has officially pulled the plug on all industrial action. That means no more strikes. They have been asking different year levels not to turn up to school in that ongoing bid to get a better pay and better work conditions, but that strategy is no more. The PPTA this evening is saying that they're entering an arbitration process of negotiation. They've already rejected two offers, so they're hoping this new new method will yield different results. Now, there will be a union meeting next Tuesday, so there's still uh, going to be some kind of disruption to schools over the next couple of weeks, but schools have already uh, contacted parents or started contacting parents about what their plans are to deal with that. That's Perry Wilton live in our Auckland newsroom. Thanks very much, Perry. Immigration Minister Michael Wood has resigned after failing to disclose even more shares he held, which posed a conflict of interest. It's the third minister Chris Hipkins has lost in as many months. The Prime Minister has now proposed a massive clean-up of how conflicts are managed in an attempt to mop up yet another ministerial mess. Here's political editor Jenna Lynch. Another one bites the dust. I have advised the Governor-General to accept Michael Wood's resignation as a minister. Michael Wood was axed as Transport Minister for failing to declare Auckland Airport shares. He solemnly swore there were no more shares to declare, but yesterday he opened his family trust and, oops, shares everywhere. I was both angry and also incredibly frustrated. Not just any shares, shares in Chorus and Spark. Wood gave telecom specialists a green list residency track as Immigration Minister. And and National Australia Bank shares, the parent company of BNZ, never disclosed those when Cabinet was considering the banking market study. Michael has had plenty of opportunity to identify his shareholdings, to make sure that any conflicts were appropriately managed when necessary, that he was divesting them. Um, he's had more than enough time to be able to do that. I don't understand. Um, why he has not done that. Michael Wood full of regret about the airport shares last week. This is an issue that I, I really, really profoundly regret. But coming up empty on everything else. And to, I only learned of these yesterday um, when repeatedly through um, numerous conversations I've asked him if there are other issues that I should be aware of and he has said no. Um, that's beyond frustrating. This morning, immediately after his final appearance before Select Committee... Happy to answer questions. ..hauled into the PM's office for the question that ended his career. Did you ask him to resign? Um, I, I indicated to him that I thought his position as a minister was untenable. The wheels are falling off the bus. This is a government that is actually falling apart. I wish him well. I, I guess he could have a pretty good future as a stockbroker. Wood, full of woe, released a statement saying, there has not been a second of my political career where any of my financial interests have influenced my actions or even crossed my mind. In some respects, my deprioritisation of my personal financial affairs has led to the situation. Was Michael Wood remorseful when you spoke with him? Um, I think it would be fair to say he's pretty crushed. The PM's so sick of the series of stuff-ups, he's ordered a conflict clean-up. The Cabinet Office will now be responsible for quarterly reports to the Prime Minister of any conflicts. There'll be a new escalation process if ministers refuse to engage or follow the advice of. The Cabinet Office, the PM, will conduct face-to-face -face annual reviews of conflicts with all ministers. Each minister will have one person in their office nominated to be across their conflicts, and at the start of every Cabinet meeting, there will be a conflict disclosure. Is there a lack of respect for the office of the Prime Minister among the Cabinet Ministers? 
Uh, no, I don't believe that's the case. Distraction with a capital D, four months out from an election. The election's going to be a tight and competitive race, um, and I'm in it to win it. Christopher Luxon says, let's go to the polls now. I, I'm ready to go. I'll go any day. I'll go tomorrow. Uh, I'm re he's not doing the job, and I'll do the job for him. The countdown clock ticks on 115 days. Well, Jenna joins us now from Parliament. Jenna, this is messy. What on earth is going on? Bread and butter is officially toast. Hipkins must feel like he's on some kind of sick carnival ride, bouncing from blunder to scandal to shambles to debacle and back again. He looked ashen when he walked in here to make that announcement. Bamboozled as the rest of us as to why Michael Wood never took this seriously. He is roundly viewed as a competent, diligent, intelligent minister. His job was on the line. He got more warning shots across the bow than is imaginable in politics and he ignored all of them. Hipkins has doled out Michael Wood's portfolios to some of his senior ministers. I'm not going to bother you with who because at this rate they could change by next week. It is chaotic. I cannot keep up with it myself. But basically the job of those ministers is to not screw anything up. They are in caretaker roles until election day, a day that Hipkins may just be starting to dread. That's right. Jenna Lynch, live at Parliament. Thanks very much. Two Oranga Tamariki staff have been removed from youth facilities following serious allegations of sexual misconduct. Oranga Tamariki has asked former police commissioner Mike Bush to run the facilities and perform a rapid review. Political reporter Amelia Wade has more. Oranga Tamariki is tasked with keeping children safe. It admits it's failed to do that. I am incredibly uh, upset about this happening inside Oranga Tamariki. I'm very upset. It's a breach of trust. In early June, the agency's leadership was told about a staffer's alleged inappropriate sexual behaviour at a care and protection facility. A second, separate issue was raised after the Office of the Children's Commissioner visited a different youth justice site last week. Two incidences too many for me. Oranga Tamariki boss Chappie Dikani says so far they know five children have been involved. Former police commissioner Mike Bush has been called in to investigate. To ensure that all of the Tamariki, all the young people that are in the residence, Kaimahi, all of the staff are safe. They do not know how widespread this could be. With these two staff members removed, are your residences safe? for young people. What I can say is we have removed um, those two people who have alleged to have committed these offences from those residences. The Children's Commissioner says shut the residences down now. We're putting our, you know, our most sort of marginalised children really in places that uh, are more akin to a prison. Yeah, I'm confident that change is occurring. Um, it is a, um, a big ship to turn around, Oranga Tamariki. I am so angry on behalf of these kids. We cannot take their harm back. Act MP Karen Chua wants a child of the state herself on the verge of tears. We haven't even finished apologising for past abuse and the abuse is still happening. Apologies mean nothing if it is still happening and nobody wants to stand up and actually take responsibility for this. These are children that rely on us. It is frustrating and disappointing that a small number of individuals have overshadowed, overshadowed the work that Oranga Tamariki has done. I feel as if my heart has been ripped out, squashed, and torn apart because not once did that minister take responsibility. Not once. Raw political emotion because at the heart of this issue are some of our most vulnerable children. Amelia, there have been previous concerns raised about staff at Oranga Tamariki. Yes, in November the Children's Commissioner released this report after a site visit to a youth justice facility in Christchurch in which she raises serious concerns about staff behaviour including staff giving mokopono vapes and cell phones and staff even having conversation about hot dates. What's more, News Hub understands health and safety concerns were raised at one of the facilities involved in today's developments but an investigation wasn't launched until the second sexual behaviour allegations were raised 
raised last week and we understand that the facilities are totally unconnected. So serious questions to be answered here including one they could not answer today and that is where the staff working at the facilities have been vetted by police. That is political reporter live there from Parliament, Amelia Waitenakwe. They have less than 30 hours of oxygen left, but there is one glimmer of hope for the five men on board the small submarine that went missing during a mission to view the Titanic. Rescuers haven't seen anything yet, but there are new reports they've heard something. US correspondent Mitch McCann is at the Coast Guard search headquarters in Boston and he joins us. Mitch, what do we know? Yeah, good evening, Aurini. In the last hour and a half, the U.S. Coast Guard here behind me in Boston have confirmed that a Canadian plane flying around the search and rescue zone has detected noises from under the water. They've been described as banging sounds at 30-minute intervals. Now, that information has been passed on to the U.S. Navy, and they'll take that into consideration with the search and rescue operation moving forward. And that really is the only glimmer of hope in what has been a day of bad news. In some of Earth's most remote waters, planes, boats and even another submarine have failed to find the tiny Titan submersible. Our crews are working around the clock to ensure that we are doing everything possible to locate the Titan and the five crew members. To date, those search efforts have not yielded any results. The US Navy, Coast Guard and the Canadian Coast Guard are all joining the search. Time is running out for Titan with less than 30 hours of oxygen left on board. Five crew have been trapped for three days on a trip planned to last just eight hours. I'm sick to my stomach with nerves. I'm terrified. I'm anxious. I'm not sleeping at the moment. Every single minute feels like hours. It's not good. It, it really isn't good. It, it will be a miracle if the crew returns alive. The crew set off on Friday from the Canadian coast towards the decaying shipwreck 600 kilometres offshore. On Sunday, the submersible began its descent to the Titanic, 3,800 metres below the surface. But an hour and 45 minutes into that journey, all communication was lost. It's hard to overstate the difficulty of finding this vessel now. It's the size of a ute missing in an area that would cover the distance from Hamilton to the top of the North Island. I love adventure. I've been lucky enough to get opportunities in my life to do adventurous things. On board the vessel is British billionaire Hamish Harding, who's been to space and has sailed around the globe. He's joined by Pakistani British businessman Shazada Dawood and his son Suleiman. Also on board is French researcher Paul Henri Najelay, who has led six expeditions to the shipwreck before. And Ocean Gate Chief Executive Stockton Rush is on board too. This is not a thrill ride for tourists. It's much more. Ocean Gate has been sending passengers to the Titanic for two years, each one paying around 400,000 New Zealand dollars. The company is the only sub in the world that can reach the depths of the Titanic and has made bold claims about its safety. Your thrusters can go, your lights can go, you're still going to be safe. Those claims are now being put to the test in the cruelest possible way. OK, Mitch, what else can you tell us about this company, Ocean Gate? Yeah, well, it's been revealed today, Michael, that in 2018, five years ago, a group of exploration experts wrote to OceanGate, the company that owns this missing submersible, saying they were concerned about the experimental approach they were taking towards tourism uh, down to the Titanic and said there could be catastrophic consequences. Fast forward five years uh, to now, we're talking about this incident in Boston and hoping it's not going to be a catastrophe. Just reminding you, there is a glimmer of hope tonight that a Canadian plane in the search and rescue area has detected noises under the water. The US Navy will now take that into consideration as they continue the search and rescue effort, but the hours are counting down. Michael. Absolutely, they are. That's uh, Mitch McCann. Kia ora, Mitch, live in Boston for us. Experts have told News Hub survival is unlikely for the crew on board, calling the rescue mission a very daunting task. Even if the submarine is somewhere on the surface, the five men are bolted in and depleting oxygen supply means they may have mere hours to live. Well, Nick Truebridge is here with more on this. What can you tell us, Nick? 
Yeah, Mike, we'll talk about drop in the ocean. The, mission, the missing Ocean Gate sub Titan is just 6.7 metres long. If it's sitting on the surface of the water, it's a mere blip on a search area nearly 33 times the size of Lake Taupo. Now, if it's on the sea floor amongst the Titanic's debris field, that's the size of 1,000 football pitches. Now let's talk about actually getting down there. Blue whales can only reach 500 metres, while military subs, well they can make it about 750 metres before they're in danger of imploding. Now the wreck of the Titanic, that's about 3,800 metres under the surface. Think 11 sky towers stacked one on top of the other. Now, the deepest underwater rescue ever recorded was only 480 metres when the crew of Pisces 3 was saved off the coast of Ireland back in the 70s. But as you've just heard from Mitch, noises below the surface are giving cause for hope. Nick Truebridge, thanks very much. Inmates at Rimataka Prison have slammed corrections officers claiming they took too long to help a prisoner who was found unresponsive in his cell. One prisoner told News Hub inmates had to perform CPR on the man who later died. But as Leighton Hakeel reports, corrections dispute some of the accusations. Rimutaka Prison is one of the country's largest. Around 600 inmates are housed here and corrections has confirmed on Sunday one of them died. I want to acknowledge the uh, efforts of the corrections officers and even other prisoners who um, helped in this situation. But News Hub has spoken to one of those prisoners. He claims staff failed to deal with the situation properly. We've agreed not to name him and have revoiced his comments to protect his identity. It's disgusting that three inmates had to perform CPR on another inmate and officers just let it happen. Officers didn't intervene, officers done nothing. He says at around 4pm an officer and a couple of inmates found a prisoner unresponsive in a cell. The inmates began performing CPR. The officer froze, wasn't sure what to do, they pressed the emergency button, they called for backup, instead of just calling for medical, they just called for backup. He adds it took 15 minutes for a defibrillator to arrive and inmates had to use it. You've got inmates in the unit now scared because we have to rely on another inmate to save our life. At least another 25 minutes went by before paramedics arrived. The patient was moved into the shared compound and they took over CPR, but he couldn't be saved. If the accounts I've seen are anywhere near what happened, it's an appalling situation. Barrister Nigel Hampton even believes the Crimes Act may have been breached as Corrections has a duty to provide the necessaries of life. And the sort of medical care or lack of medical care uh, that was given here would indicate to me that uh, they may well have failed in that duty. News Hub has spoken to a second prisoner who corroborated the story, but Corrections disputes some of the allegations, saying in a statement that prisoners did provide assistance when the man was first found, but only for about 15 minutes, and staff led that response. The prisoner made another allegation that the man's body remained in the shared prison space for hours, even when dinner was served. How did that make you feel? Sick. That's not only culturally insensitive, that's just wrong full stop. You know what I mean? There's no tikanga or nothing. I believe privacy screens were put up to um, try... That. The man's death is not being treated as suspicious and has been referred to the coroner. Corrections is conducting an internal review, while the independent inspectorate will also investigate. Leighton Haeckel, News Hub. Heather's here now with a look at today's weather and the rain's arrived in the north. Yes, the first of the rain bands. It's making its way southeast, the beginning of a wet few days. Over 50 millimetres has already fallen over Kaitaia. Now, today's top temp again went to Whanganui, 21 degrees. That's seven degrees warmer than average for this time of year. And yes, it continues tomorrow. Details up after sport. 21 sounds pretty good. Thanks, <laughs> Heather. Rents are on the rise again, hitting a new national 
record, but as families are forced to move to keep costs down, new research has raised the alarm about housing insecurity for kids and how it affects them as adults. The amount Kiwis are losing to cyber crimes is soaring. What you can do to keep your money safe. And would lowering the voting age to 16 help increase turnout at local body elections? We bring you the latest on the missing submarine in the North Atlantic. Can they be found before time runs out? Plus, Harrison Ford tells us how it feels to say goodbye to his iconic character. The project at 7 after New Sub. Hoki mai anō, welcome back. Average rent prices have hit a new unwanted record, jumping to $610 per week. The Trade Me figures reveal a concerning trend that's put, uh, that puts even more pressure on families trying to make ends meet. And as Kelly Callahan reports, there's new evidence housing insecurity could have a generational impact. Rent just got that little bit more expensive. Three months after cracking the $600 mark for the first time, it's jumped up again. What we're seeing in the month of May is a $35 increase um, year on year. So uh, the median weekly rent in New Zealand reached $610, which is the highest it's been. Rental increases are happening right around the country. Auckland, Taranaki, Manawatu, Nelson, Tasman and Canterbury all rose more than 10%. Taranaki hit with the biggest percentage growth. 15%, an extra additional $80 to rent a property down in Taranaki. Um, in terms of actual um, cost-wise, it was the Queenstown Lakes, $150. We have a chronic undersupply of housing in New Zealand, and that isn't going to be fixed anytime soon. But in the meantime, we've got a generation of renters who are being impoverished. Tightening the squeeze on families too. Unfortunately, there's renters up and down the country who are families who are having to make really hard choices about what they and their families are going to go without because of rental price increases. That impact can be generational. New research from three US universities reveal housing insecurities as a child is linked to worse mental health later in life. Here, a longitudinal study found nearly half of 12-year-olds have moved home at least once since they were eight years old. The signs are pointing towards rent prices continuing to rise. It's not great news at the moment and we think the setup is going to continue but we also understand that you know cost of living is really really hurting people up and down the country at the moment so how much further that can go is probably somewhat limited. Renters hoping that there's a ceiling soon as they try to keep a roof over their heads. Kaylee Callahan, News Hub. The government agency in charge of cyber security says some New Zealanders are being brought to their knees by scams. It's seen a massive upswing in the amount of money we're losing, nearly $6 million in the first three months of this year. Janneke Terellen has the story. Another day, another text saying you need to pay your road toll. But it's not the transport agency, it's a scammer trying to trick you out of cash. It's happening consistently and constantly. Uh, so we're seeing these uh, crime groups um, uh, pivoting from campaign to campaign. Text scams are the most common. This one looks like the IRD and promises a tax refund. It links to a realistic looking website asking you to verify your card number, which is then used to steal your money. And the problem is escalating. Reported incidents are up 12% in the first three months of this year compared to the previous three. But look at this. The amount of money we have actually lost is up 66%. Almost $6 million that we know of straight into the pockets of scammers. We've seen businesses go insolvent and a lot of uh, people who have been struggling to actually um, survive in these very tight economic times uh, are actually being uh, essentially brought to their knees. The higher value losses are thanks to a second type of scam gaining traction, bogus investment companies. You've gone from the penthouse to the doghouse, mate. Channel 7 Spotlight recently busted one such operation involving smooth-talking British men living in Kuala Lumpur. You could see fake members of staff for, for, uh, with their images. You could see fake products fake um, uh, reviews, fake uh, testimonials, any of these things can be done plausibly and realistically to make people believe that the product that's in front of them right now is real. So the government's computer emergency response team wants us to be less trusting. It recommends you check the company's office website before signing up to a deal to make sure they're registered. And double check the spelling, because it says 85% of scams are preventable. And if you do fall victim, reporting it can sometimes Help you recover the stolen cash. Yannicka Turrell and News Hub. 
Andrews and later with sport and some surprise inspiration for the Silver Ferns ahead of their World Cup defence. Yeah, I tell you what, we didn't see this coming from coach Dame Nolene Todua today. She's told us why she's been watching the NBA for strategy tips and scouting some of the game's biggest stars to help the Ferns go back to back. And a shock twist in the racism scandal that saw the All Whites abandon their friendly match against Qatar. E haere tonu nei, still to come, there's been a recommendation to drop the voting age in local body elections to 16 and to give the GST raised by rates payments to councils to help fund local projects. Is it possible that we may never retrieve the submarine and never find out what really happened? Yeah, I think that's a possibility. If it decided to go into the Titanic, then they might never be found. Four Israeli settlers on the occupied West Bank have been killed in a shooting Israel blames on Palestinian gunmen. It's the deadliest attack on Israelis since January and follows a fierce clash involving Israeli soldiers in a Janine yesterday. That killed five Palestinians and left 91 more injured. Both Palestinian suspects in today's attack were killed by Israeli forces. President Joe Biden's son, Hunter, has agreed to plead guilty to tax evasion charges and illegal possession of a handgun. You'd think Biden's rival, Donald Trump, would be happy about it, but he's not, calling the plea deal the equivalent of handing him a parking ticket. The charges are willful, uh, willful failure to pay income tax, which is a misdemeanor, and the gun charge will be eventually removed if Biden stays out of trouble. An independent review of local government has recommended a complete overhaul to improve the way councils are run. It's made a raft of suggestions, including lowering the, the voting age to 16 and merging councils. William Tariti reports. The people of Aotearoa are represented by 78 local councils, but a review into local government has found their voices aren't being heard. Clearly the local has gone out of local government. And as a result, people are disengaged with their councils. In last year's local body election, only 40% of voters turned out, and this review says a complete overhaul is needed to turn that around. The actual local government sector itself, and I'd argue the central government sector, is not sustainable moving forward. There needs to be change. To do that, the reporter has made a raft of recommendations, some of them contentious. 17 key recommendations. Um, some of them will be quite controversial within our sector. A key one extending the local election cycle from three to four years, boosting funding by funnelling funds raised by the GST paid on rates back into councils and consolidating some of those councils so they're better resourced. Though Central Hawke's Bay's mayor won't call it amalgamation. I don't think in the report it uses the word amalgamation anywhere. Um, and, and actually what I see is uh, the ability for, an, uh, for a networked approach in regions. And to try and boost low voter turnout, it suggests dropping the voting age to 16. So we asked young Wellingtonians if they cared enough to vote. I do support that. I'm 16 myself. I don't support it. I think... As a 16-year-old and teenager, you've still got a lot to learn in life. If the age of consent is 16, then people at 16 should be able to vote. The local government minister wasn't available for an interview, but said in a statement that the recommendations are not government policy. Though Karen McAnulty did say that it provides a good opportunity to talk with local government about what changes are needed. William Ceretti, News Hub. Organisers of a North Canterbury hunting competition say they reinstated a feral cat killing category after an outpouring of support from the community. The junior category was pulled from the competition after prompting a global backlash in April. Rules have now been changed allowing adults to kill the feral cats, but they must be trapped first and killed using a minimum of a 22 rifle. But animal rights group SAFE is still concerned domestic cats will get caught in the crossfire. It's actually glorifying the killing of cats. Um, we've seen some pretty disgusting rhetoric online just over the last 24 hours, people posting images of dead and mutilated cats on social media. That's not about conservation. The North Canterbury Hunting Competition will donate $5 for every cat that's killed to the New Zealand Conservation Trust, a charity which campaigns to protect our native birds. 
Police say the death of an 89-year-old man found in Half Moon Bay is not being treated as suspicious. On Monday, a woman was filmed being escorted away by police, but she has since been released. The post-mortem is now complete and police say so are their inquiries. The father of an Auckland dairy worker who was fatally stabbed last year is demanding action from the government to prevent further tragedies. Kalidas Patel was among representatives from the Dairy and Small Business Owners Group who presented a petition to Parliament this afternoon. Lucy Thompson reports. Violent crime. It's an ongoing problem with no sign of letting up. Not, the Dairy and Business Owners Group says, without government intervention. Crime is out of control. We are getting robbed, vest, burgled, you name it. Today, representatives from around the country gathered outside Parliament to present two petitions, launched in the days following Janet Patel's death at the Rose Cottage Superette in Auckland. His father among those in attendance. He's saying that, he's saying that yeah, I already lost my son. I lost already my only son. At least this incident shouldn't happen again. The group also presented a manifesto detailing specifically how they want the government to combat crime. Police Minister Ginny Anderson acknowledged the severity of the situation and says she'll consider all options once the petition is before the committee. Until then, she made a promise to the community. I will continue uh, to making sure our front line is resourced. We've seen a significant number of apprehensions and prosecutions during the spike in crime, and I will continue to work to make sure that that front line uh, comes when you need them. But she says the problem isn't confined to New Zealand. We have seen a crime spike right across the world post-COVID. Australia, UK uh, and the United States are all seeing these similar effects. But Nationals Police spokesperson person says that's a cop-out. There is no reason why we shouldn't be on top of this problem. There's no reason why we shouldn't be the safest country in the world. Reported retail crime has risen by 40% over the past year. Violent crime in particular is up 30%. And National says the country's now experiencing a ram raid every 15 hours. And the petition follows a vicious 72 hours of crime with incidents up and down the country, including an axe attack at three restaurants on Auckland's North Shore. A terrifying reality that officials admit won't be solved overnight. Lucy Thompson, News Hub. Well, shake it off, Kiwi fans. Taylor Swift isn't bringing her sellout tour here. She's going to give the Aussies five concerts instead, two in Melbourne and three in Sydney. We'll tell you how the NBA is providing inspiration for the Silver Ferns' World Cup defence, plus why there's renewed confusion over where Bowden Barrett will line up for the All Blacks during the Rugby Championship. And Baz Ball backfires for England as the Aussies give the hosts a taste of their own medicine and go 1-0 up in the Ashes. Indiana Jones is still cracking the whip well into his 80s. We chat to action hero Harrison Ford. And the heartwarming story of how nine-year-old Martin met his best new friend Raj. The Project at Seven. Climb into adventure with the new Suzuki Jimny and News Hub Sport. Silver Ferns coach Dame Nolene Toto has been thinking outside the box ahead of next month's World Cup in South Africa. And a bid to have the defending champs ahead of the chasing pack, Toto has been watching the NBA to see what ideas and strategies she can borrow to add a new dimension to the Ferns' performance. And as Ollie Ritchie reports, one player in particular has caught her attention. Five weeks out from the Netball World Cup and Silver Ferns' training is intense. <laughs> It's something Dame Nolene Todua wants to see more of before their defence begins in South Africa. We know that we need to lift it up in certain areas. To do that, Todua has gone unconventional, tapping into the NBA to try and add systems she's seen work there into the Ferns game. So I've been on that Google and seen you know, how they set up their, their strategy and structures. So uh, I think if you can gleam a lot from other places, other countries, other people, that's what it's about to learn and be better. That's something Toto has looked to do in her own coaching since their World Cup success four years ago. 
looking to the NBA, the latest step in that process. You know, when you look at the NBA and how they act, how they portray, and I know it's again, it's not like the Kiwi way, but there's more scope that we can move into and possibly implement some new stuff going into our game. Toto is especially impressed by recent NBA champion Nikola Jokic, particularly his command of the court. I like the joker, so I think he's uh, he's the master at uh, time and space is what I say. Mid-quarter, Gina Crampton feels that sort of attention to detail will hold the ferns in good stead. Whatever she brings to the table has a long-term plan. Um, it's very thought out and um, usually brings success as well. If the silver ferns can emulate the success of Jokic and the Nuggets, there might be similar celebrations in a few weeks. Ollie Ritchie, News Hub. Qatar's Football Association has rejected claims all whites midfielder Michael Boxer was racially abused yesterday, instead levelling the same accusations at the New Zealanders. The All Whites abandoned their friendly against Qatar at half time after Boxer was allegedly targeted with a racial slur by Yusuf Abdurasag. But in a statement, Qatar has suggested their striker was in fact the victim of abuse during the match in Austria. New Zealand football is set to lodge an official complaint with FIFA. Football's governing body are yet to comment on the matter. Bowden Barrett's admitted he doesn't know what position he'll be playing when the international season gets underway. He's been listed as a number 10 in the All Blacks Rugby Championship squad, but in recent years he's slotted in at fullback with Richie Moonga playing at first five. Coach Ian Foster also name-checked Barrett as one of the reasons Sean Stevenson was overlooked. Players who won't feature in this week's Super Rugby final gathered in the Bay of Plenty today for the first All Blacks camp of the year, which Barrett says will go a long way to sorting out where he'll play. Being on the same page with a new uh, coaching group, the new players, the combinations, all of that, the strategy, uh, I'm sure a lot will come out of the next two weeks before we get on the plane and head, o- head over to Argentina. Barrett says he's looking forward to the challenge when he heads to Mendoza for the first time ahead of the All Blacks Rugby Championship opener against Argentina in just over a fortnight. A year on from the shock of being cut from the central contract list, Leah Tahuhu has earned herself a new deal with the White Ferns. Despite being overlooked in 2022, Tahuhu has continued to be selected by new coach Ben Sawyer over the last 12 months. And while her efforts on the field have earned her a contract for the upcoming year, she's already looking beyond that. Obviously there's a a one-day World Cup in 2025 that I've sort of got my eye on. Um, One-day cricket is the pinnacle for us Um, as female cricketers. We don't play test cricket, so uh, yeah, that one-day World Cup is something that I've certainly got my eye on. Joining her among the new inclusions on the contract list are Northern District's wicketkeeper Bernadine Bezadenhout and Canterbury batter Kate Anderson. After five thrilling days of Test cricket, Australia has taken a 1-0 lead in the Ashes with victory in a series opener that went back and forth until the final minutes of play. Still needing 54 runs with just two wickets in hand, it was a captain's knock from Pat Cummins that got the Aussies over the line in a test that saw baseball backfire for the hosts. Gordon Finlater has the action. After five days of edge-of-your-seat action, it all came down to this. Pat Cummins more accustomed to winning matches with the ball, but he's declared his decisive knock of 44 his greatest victory. Number one, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. To feel like we um, we clinched one, kind of, that perhaps was out of our grasp there for a little while. It's pretty satisfying. Starting the day 107 for three, chasing 281, it didn't look like it was going to be the Aussie's day. Yeah! Scott Boland and Travis Head went quickly, and when Cameron Green and Usman Kawaja both chopped on, it quickly became England's to lose. Standing in their way, Australia's captain. There he goes. Up and over. Nailed it. Two sixes off the same Joe Root over, swinging the momentum. But England still had their chances. He's had a go at it. There's a man out there. Oh! I think he's put it down. Ben Stokes made to rue the mistake, his side coming up just short in another five-day thriller. It was an emotional roller coaster um, to be out in the middle there. And while England are now on the back foot, Stokes says his side's aggressive approach won't change. I think it's a bit early to say that the Ashes are slipping away after one game. Australia celebrating a famous victory, but there's still plenty to play for. Gordon Findlater, News Up. 
Kiwi cyclist Neve Fisher-Black has powered to her first World Tour stage victory on the Tour de Suisse. The 22-year-old was part of a two-rider breakaway and mustered enough energy to out-sprint her opponent to win the final stage of the Tour. It's going to be a victory for Neve Fisher-Black. The first big pro win for the New Zealander. Uh, yeah, super cool for the team and uh, super cool for me personally. So, uh, yeah, super cool day. She finished first in the best young rider category and fifth in the points classification to help her team to claim overall honours. That is your sport tonight. And, team, I've been looking forward to this next item. I know you're particularly gutted about this, aren't you, Michael? Uh, very, very distraught, actually, yeah. Andrew. Sorry yeah. to hear, mate. Sorry to hear. You OK? All right. I'll let everyone know what they're talking about. And not, it is, actually. of course, Taylor Swift. <laughs> Taylor Swift, everyone. She may face some bad blood from a number of New Zealand fans after her international tour dates were unveiled this morning. The three-and-a-half-hour career-spanning eras show will miss our shores and instead stop in Australia with two nights in Melbourne and three in Sydney. The American League of the Tour broke Ticketmaster's website with more than 2.4 million tickets sold in a single day. Tickets for the Aussie shows will go on sale next week. Our top stories tonight. Michael Wood has resigned as a minister after it emerged he had failed to disclose even more shares he held, which posed a conflict of interest. The Prime Minister has now proposed a massive clean-up of how conflicts are managed. Two Oranga Tamariki staff have been removed from youth facilities following serious allegations of sexual misconduct. Oranga Tamariki has asked former Police Commissioner Mike Bush to run the facilities and to perform a rapid review. Rescuers are continuing to search for the sub that went missing during a trip to the wreck of the Titanic. Oxygen supplies are running out, but there are reports that underwater banging noises have been detected in the search area. Hi, Heidi Akine, News Hub Weather, and it's a wet end to the week, Heather. Yes, we're in for a drenching. Already Northland is feeling the effects of the low to the top of your screens. Now the centre of the system will lie over Cape Reinga by midnight tomorrow night. For now, only one orange heavy rain warning is in force for Gisborne, about in north of Tolaga Bay till 3pm tomorrow. More next, then on the project, you're following this incredible submarine story. Yeah, it sounds like an absolute nightmare. Lost at the bottom of the ocean, can anything be done to save them? We're also talking to Harrison Ford about being Indiana Jones for the very last time. I reckon he's been saying that since 95. I think he's got three more in him. The project is next. Tomorrow's weather brought to you by Nature. Turn it to power by Meridian. No, my Arnold, welcome back. Tomorrow will be the shortest day of the year and we will still be stuck in a warm and moist northeast flow which is smothering the country. We're sort of wedged between a low to the northwest and a high to the southeast. Now the low will spin out its fronts and rain over northern New Zealand tonight and central New Zealand tomorrow. Keep the Waiponamu to the South Island. Low cloud and patchy drizzle clings to the eastern seaboard overnight. Patchy low cloud and fog develops inland again with fine skies elsewhere. Now tomorrow there is rain in the north with heavy falls over eastern parts of Marlborough and patchy drizzle or showers for the east coast. Get the Ika Amaui to the North Island rain. Quite a bit of it too. Thunderstorms for the north of the island. Most can expect rain overnight, but the southwest section will stay dry. Now tomorrow, the heavy rain up top does ease to showers early morning, but there will be heavy falls and thunderstorms at times throughout the day. Showers, they will reach the southwest too. So it is a wet day up top with heavy and thundery showers possible for almost everyone. Hamilton, you'll be spared the thunder, but you will have occasional rain, strong east to northeast winds for all. Occasional rain for Tokoroa and periods of heavy rain for Taupo. Everyone else can expect also heavy rain with thunderstorms and fresh or strong east to northeast winds. It's wet out east with periods of rain, sometimes heavy with thunderstorms for Gisborne. Winds will be from the east or northeast and strong in the afternoon for Hawke's Bay. It is better for the rest of the north, but it's still not great. Cloudy with showers and strong or gusty easterlies for Manawatu and Kapiti. Fern effect and full force again for Whanganui, so another warm day for you. There's rain at times tomorrow for Nelson with southeasters. The rest of the northwest will be fine with just some high cloud, light winds, maybe an easterly for Westport. 
Rain at times over the divide, especially up top, with heavy rain in the afternoon for Kaikoura. You might be unlucky with drizzle south of Christchurch with light winds. It's actually pretty good for the rest of the south, except for the cloudy periods in drizzle. Unfortunately, it is foggy again for inland areas. That means another bleak and cold day for Alexandra. Now, Ōtepote Dunedin, it's OK for you tomorrow, mainly fine. Cloudy periods with possible drizzle along the coast with an afternoon nor'easterly. Mostly cloudy with a few showers around Ōtotahi Christchurch. Nor'east has become a little fresh in the afternoon and evening. It is a cloudy day tomorrow for the capital. There will be pockets of sun mixed in with showers. Nor'easters and a high of 15. Te mātoa Maui Hawke's Bay, wet, periods of rain, heavy at times, especially about the inland ranges, strong easterlies along the coast. It's wet for Tauranga with periods of rain, yes, heavy at times, and yes, there is the chance of thunderstorms as well with fresh easterlies. Hamilton, you will also need to plan for rain. Fresh easterlies in the morning and afternoon with a high of 15. Rain tonight with nor'easters gusting 80 k's for Auckland. It does ease to showers before dawn, but there is still the risk of thunderstorms and heavy falls tomorrow. Now, Australia also has a low pressure system with its own front moving over the southeast, so they cop their share of rain tomorrow, but looking good for most of the Pacific. Just a few showers again for parts of Samoa. Looking ahead, and things start to improve up top for the weekend. Won't be totally dry, but likely to be just back to showers. Not so lucky out east with heavy rain at times on Friday. Windy too, with that continuing through the first half of the weekend. Showers for the rest of the north as well, with Taranaki looking likely to be dry on Friday. Another very warm weekend for Whanganui. By Saturday, all in the top half of the South Island will have rain, heavy too at times, but improving for Sunday. Real mix of rain, showers, cloudy spells and wind for the lower south. Overnight lows staying above freezing though through till next week.